Hello, I'm Jonathan Smith. I'm the lead pastor at One Church TO, and you're listening to the teaching time from our weekend gathering. We're an imperfect community of over 70 nationalities and five generations who are attempting to follow and shine Jesus in the greater Toronto area. Our vision, it's so simple. We want to help people from all walks of life know God, love people, and in turn, impact our city for good. We've designed these weekends to be meaningful, challenging, and encouraging, and I hope that's what you get from listening. Uh, If someone says to you, let's go to church, (laughs) and you say yes, you say, okay, where are you going to go? If someone says, meet you at church, where are you going to meet them? You know, for, for, for most of us, part of this gathering, our minds would go to 2885 Kennedy Road, right? A a church building that we gather at to do church. Uh, I remember this one lady that was part of our church family for a year. She said, anytime I invite someone to church uh, and they'll say, well, where is it? And she'll say, on Kennedy, just a pinch above Finch. That was her way of locating what the church is, where it really is located. Now, does that mean, though, then, that as we gather online, that we're really not doing church because uh, we can't meet physically out of trying to do everything we can to keep one another safe during a pandemic? Does that mean that we we cannot have church because we're meeting online? Um, And what about the church in Acts? You know, the Acts is a book of the Bible that describes the first days of doing church, and they met by the thousands physically in the temple courts and from house to house in Jerusalem. And does that mean that, uh, that when they were scattered because of the persecution, remember, you went to church, you got dragged off to jail, that your leaders were getting killed, and so it was unsafe for them to gather. They couldn't do church the way that they used to. And so they had to meet in smaller groups in homes. No church building, no digital gathering. Does that mean that they could not have church? What needs to happen in order to have church? What's essential? Do you need to have a pastor or a priest to lead the gathering in order to have church? Do you need to have a building or liturgy? Do you need to have worship songs in order to have church? Do you need an affiliation with a Christian denomination or Christian organization in order to have church. You know, in this series that Pastor Jonathan and I are teaching him, whose church is this? Jesus was clear about whose church it was, right? I will build my church. He he declares it authoritatively, uh, conclusively. It's his church, but he's not talking about a building. He's not talking about an organization or denomination. The building was just where people gathered, but to do church. Church was not about a place, always about a people. The church was not where you go. The church was you who go. Thank God, though, for buildings to gather in. Since since Jesus said, I'll build my church, uh, his followers have gathered in, in homes a lot over the centuries in homes, and also in catacomb caves, and cathedrals, today in rented schools and theaters, and uh, so much of what God has done in the lives of thousands and thousands of Torontonians has been a result of what's happened in this building that I'm talking to you from today, this this church building, just uh, on Kennedy, a pinch above Finch. So much of it. So thank God for the thousands of Torontonians who have come to Christ, those of us who have grown in Christ and served the community because of what happens in this building. Thank God for the building. But the building is not the church. Jesus promises to build his church. What is he talking about? What do you, what do you have to have? What's essential? What's fundamental in order to have church. Well, let's let the owner of the church tell us, okay? If Jesus says, let's go to church, what's he referring to? What is he saying are the, matter of fact, he gives four have-to-haves 
in order to have church. Here's the first one. Church happens when and where, number one, spirit and truth combine to supernaturally transform us. Now, you go to any website of any church in the city that you're living in, and you go to the part on the menu that says statement of faith or what we believe, and uh, you will find there enough truth to... uh, to give you the gospel, to give you what really matters. You will find that all, all churches that uh, are following Jesus will basically tell you there's a God who loves you, who sent his son for you to die for you on the cross so you could be forgiven and freed up from that sin to Jesus rose from the dead so we can have eternal life with him. And You'll find all the, the, the right truths. You'll, you'll find enough truth there to transform you. But the problem is, of course, in a lot of churches, that just ain't happening. I remember meeting with the leader of a great historic church here in our city of Toronto, and he he said, I'm a deacon. It was the equivalent of a deacon. He was on the board of governance of the church he was in. And he said, you know, we've got this wonderful building, been there for how many decades? We, we have a, a wonderful denomination that we are a part of. And if you saw what that denomination believed, they believed the same gospel that this church and all churches that follow Jesus would believe. He said, well, you know, we've got finances, we have administration, we have songs, we have a sermon when we show up together. But he said, we don't have any children. We don't have any youth. We're all seniors. And every year there's less of us. If this keeps up, there isn't going to be a church. All they're going to have is a building. And I, he was asking me, you know, for for input. And and I had the same kind of conversation with him that Jesus had when this topic came up. Jesus had this conversation uh, with a man, then a woman, and then with his leaders. All right, let's look at each of them. And in each of them, you're going to see how Jesus said, In order to have church happen, you need to have more than just truth. You need to have the spirit. For instance, the man that came to see him made an appointment to see Jesus. He was a religious leader in the religion of Judaism in Jesus' time. He was a Pharisee, sect of his denomination. And he came to see Jesus, and, and Jesus didn't talk to him too long before he said, you know, you've got truth. And, and Nicodemus came with a whole lot of Bible truth of the Old Testament, the, what Moses had written and the, and the prophets and, and, and the Psalms of David. He, he had a lot of truth. And Jesus did add to that truth and said, you know, that God of the Old Testament loves you so much. He, he's sending his son. That's me. But he also said this to Nicodemus. He said, but you have to have the Spirit. He said, unless you're born again of the Spirit, not physically, they had that discussion, born again of the Spirit. He said, Nick, unless you have a spiritual transformation, not enough to just have truth, you have to have the spiritual transformation in order to enter the kingdom of God. Conversation number two was with a Samaritan woman, also in the Gospel of John, just one chapter after he talked to Nicodemus, and and. Uh, you know, got into the truth about spirituality. Well, Jesus actually initiated the conversation. He said, you came here for physical water. I got spiritual water. One, you're going to thirst again and have to keep coming for. The other one will fulfill your spiritual thirst so you'll never thirst again. And, And she automatically tried to get into a debate about religious differences between the Jews and the Samaritans. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. And Jesus went above that. Jesus said, religion is not what God's looking for. Listen to what Jesus said next. He said, God is looking for those who will worship him in, have you read it before? In spirit and in truth. And when she got that, 
um, and received Jesus as the Messiah, she not only was transformed by not just truth but spirit, but she brought out a lot of people in the community who a few days later after being with Jesus said, we don't just believe because of her, our lives have been transformed because of you, Jesus. Third conversation is one Jesus has also in the Gospel of John, but with his leaders. And uh, Jesus says, I'm going to go away, but don't worry. I'm going to be with you by my spirit. And having my spirit with you will be just like having me with you. But listen to what he says. And my spirit will remind you of the truths I've already told you and will lead and guide you into all truth. You know, the spirit will lead and guide you into all truth, the spirit and the truth. And that's exactly what happened. These last two weekends in this series that Pastor Jonathan began, we have seen that in those early days of the church, did they ever get this? It wasn't just the apostles and pastors and teachers teaching God's people the truth that they took into their small groups in their homes. And, and it wasn't just about worshiping in the temple courts. It was, it was about spiritual things happening, lives being transformed, the Lord adding to the church daily, people were being transformed, supernatural miracles and healings were happening in that community. It was the spirit and truth. That, that's exactly what we see when we read about the, the church in Acts, those first days of our first brothers and sisters following Jesus. Now, so today, if we ask ourselves, are we a church? Well, it's, we see, it's more than having a building. It's more than having the government recognize us because we have uh, the required bylaws and members in this charitable organization. It's more than being affiliated with a recognized church church denomination or organization, those can all be valuable, that that, you can have all that and still not be Christ church. It, it doesn't matter here whether you're Protestant or, or Catholic or Anglican or Presbyterian or, or Baptist or Pentecostal or Catholicostal or Bapticostal. It does not matter. Listen, you can, you can zoom in anytime, anywhere, since Jesus said, I will build my church, and you can zoom in on any group of Christians, and you will find that where they are in decline, where they're not reaching new people, where they're in decline, is where they may have truth, but they do not have the Spirit. And where they're going off on a tangent, and charismatics are becoming charismatics, where, where, where that's happening, they, they try to have the Spirit, but they don't have the truth. And where the church is growing is where they have the, the spirit and the truth. I never forget years ago, I heard one uh, communicator say, if you have in the church, if you have truth without the spirit, the church will dry up. If you have the spirit without the truth, the church will blow up. But where you have the spirit and the truth together, the church will grow up. You know, and that, that's, that's where you have the church, where you have the truth and the spirit combining together to transform lives all in the presence of Jesus, all right? That, that, that's, that's when and where you have church. Secondly, church is when and where our love for one another has a place to be experienced. Our love for one another has a place to be experienced. You know, I, when I got my passport photo done, remember getting your, whether it's, you know, medical certificate or or your, your license. I, I was getting my passport uh, picture taken, and, uh, and I remember, uh, and I, you know, got ready for the picture, and I smiled, and she said, no, no, no teeth, no smile, <laughs> so I, which hit me so funny, I couldn't stop smiling, <laughs> so I think you can at least see my eyes, my Irish eyes are smiling when I, when I, I have my passport photo, but, but, we, we get these um, passports and passwords. Why? Because people want to know, are you who you say you are? Are you really who you claim to be? And Jesus said, there's one way that people will be able to tell that you are who you claim to be, that you are my disciple. He said this, he, he said, by this Everyone will know that you are my disciples. You are who you claim to be if you love one another, you know? And he says a command, a new command I give you, love one another 
Then he says this, as I have loved you. In other words, I'm not asking you to do something for someone else that I haven't already poured into you. I have loved you. So you must love one another. Now, the first century, those first Christians got this so well that I remember being in university and reading about the uh, first Christians and one um, non-Christian observer said this about those early Christians. He said, oh, how they love each other. Oh, how they love each other. And, and, and see, because Jesus loved them, they could love one another. Watch this. You know how scripture will say in the New Testament to those early Christians, accept one another as Christ accepted you. Jesus himself said, forgive one another as God has forgiven you. And then scripture says this, listen, bear one another's burdens and in doing so, you're going to fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law? The command of Christ is that we love one another. When you bear one another's burdens, that's action. That's love in action. That's showing that I, I, whatever I feel towards you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love you. I'm going to act in your best interests. And so uh, this is a have to have. But you can't, you can't love one another if you just try and, you know, do this journey with Jesus alone. You can't bear one another's burdens unless you're with one another. You can't forgive someone unless you're in relationship with them. And so none of these things that are commanded can happen unless we are doing community together, unless we are doing church. You know, the, the people that, um, Pastor Jonathan and I have had this discussion a few times, the people that we feel most sorry for are those that have just tried to do the journey with Jesus alone. And then when they go through, and we all do, a crisis or a tough time, they, they don't have any people to pray for them or care for them or, or, or carry that burden with them. Sometimes they'll just say, you know, you're the only person I, I can turn to. And that's sad because God's plan is that it's when we care for one another. But you know the people that we worry about the least when they go through a crisis? Someone who's part of a community group or a prayer group or a ministry group. They're, they're doing some activity of caring for others, and so they're known by others. And when they go through a tough time, <laughs> the very people that they were helping are, are there to help them. They, they've already built the bridge that others cross to come back and help them. All right, so there are two outcomes when we're loving one another this way, as, as Jesus loves us. Number one, and Jesus identified it, others who don't know Jesus are attracted to Jesus. Wow, how they love each other. And then secondly, those who do know Jesus grow in Jesus. You grow when you do life with people that are different than you, right? Iron sharpens iron, the proverb says. That's so true. You're not going to have that happen if you try and do life with people that just are in your echo chamber or just they're just like everything you like. You'll end up just with a, a you know, a, an unhappy holy huddle. It'll be a, a, a case of just, you know, us four and no more. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just going to narrow down. God doesn't give any one of us all of the gifts that we need. Your gifts I need, your strengths I need because I have weaknesses. I have gifts and strengths and they're there for you. God doesn't, no one of us has it all. <laughs> we need one another. You know, uh, during the pandemic, as pastors, our hearts have been lifted so many times when we hear about someone that's going through something and we find out that people, even though it's been tougher during this, you know, keep your physical distance time, have found ways to encourage and be there for them and to love them and to care for them. Oh, you, you're so good at doing that, church family. And that, that's loving others the way that Jesus loves you. And you can't do that unless you're, you're doing the Christian life in community, Alcoholics Anonymous have helped how many people over the years get free from alcohol? And, and for them, they know it, it's all about being supportive of one another, being in that supportive community. And so it, li listen to how they say it. I get drunk, but we get sober. I'm afraid, 
but we have courage. I fall down, but we get up. I want to quit, but we persist. You see, there's power in we. There's power in community. One of Jesus' have-to-haves is that we do church in community. We're, we're a we kind of place. We, we, we love one another, and it has a place for that to be experienced. Th- that's, that's, that's having church. And then third, church happens when and where we get to envision changing the world together because there's lots of us. Not just one of us, there's lots of us. Every once in a while, Jesus' disciples, his main leaders, would catch a virus. It was called uh, just us. Not justice, <laughs> just us. Just the 12 of us. And, and, and then they'd get the variant of that virus. You know, us four and no more. <laughs> it, it just reducing it down to people that were just... This is what this is. These are the people we're going to do the future with. Last week we saw one church, Jerusalem, get that virus. Remember, Jesus had just told them, "You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and uh, you're going to take the good news to people to the ends of the earth." Well, they certainly got the the Jerusalem part right, did they? <laughs> Didn't they? <laughs> they j- One church, Jerusalem, that's it. Never mind one church, Judea, or one church, Samaria. Never mind reaching others in in the world. And and so it took persecution to scatter them. And it says they brought the good news of Jesus wherever they went. And more and more people, including in Toronto today, know about the love of God because the church didn't just get stick with that virus. <laughs> Jesus gave them the ultimate vaccination. And, and they, they, in persecution, they went and they spread the good news everywhere. You know, I, I want to say this. Listen, I so appreciate Pastor Jonathan's uh, vision for one church. Even during this pandemic, he just leads the, the staff and leads us as a church to uh, find ways to, to do what Jesus wants us to be doing. Because, listen, during a pandemic, just like pandemics throughout church history, Christians who are following Jesus can be led by the Holy Spirit to find creative ways to help people and minister to people that they wouldn't have had had there not been a pandemic. And so we just adapt to what's going on and we bring help and we bring healing and we bring hope to people. And, uh, you know, last night when I was coming in for the, um, for the Saturday evening digital gathering, uh, I, 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 there was a bunch of bags of clothing outside the door that I was coming in. And the first thing I did before I got here for the service, that gathering, is I, as I brought those bags in, what are they? Last year, there were over 6,000 items of clothing that, that you, our church family, brought in for, for people. And, and there are Young Street Mission, Scott Mission, other just amazing organizations that are caring for uh, people in need in our city. And, and, and that's just January. You know, every month we, the Love Army, <laughs> with Jerry's leadership, the Love Army has some new project for us to, to, to reach out and to, to say we're, we're bigger than ourselves. We're reaching out to people in our community. And uh, I just am so thankful that, that I, I'm not just one person who can do something, but when I join together with you, we can do many things. You know, I, I, I got an illustration for you. Your individual, here, here's what it's about. Your individual contribution gets expanded when you don't try to do your Jesus life alone, but you do it with others in, in Christ church, all right? Have you heard in the news over the last few months about that uh, great historic Massey Hall, that iconic Toronto concert hall being um, being renovated and now it's been reopened and there's been some concerts there. Well, I, I don't think I've told the church family in all the over 25 years, years I've been here that I actually sang in Massey Hall. You heard me right. I sang in Massey Hall. Matter of fact, I got invited back the next year and the year after that. And I played the drums for two years for music groups 
in Massey Hall, that Toronto, Toronto's iconic concert hall. I, I, I did. You say you sang at Massey Hall? Yes, I did, back in the 70s. You say, well, then your voice must have changed a lot since the 70s because, Pastor Keith, I've heard you sing, and you, you sing the baritone. You make the tone, and we bear it. It's a baritone. And, and so, okay, all right, full disclosure here. I, I went to a Bible college that held its graduation ceremony every year in Massey Hall, where all over 300 students, whatever their voice sounded like, they were part of this student choir, and we all sang at Massey Hall. And I played the drums for them for the next couple of years when they sang at Massey Hall. But listen, what am I saying? It only happened, <laughs> not because of what I could do as an individual, but because of me being part of a group and, and doing this together. I got to do something amazing because it was part of hundreds and hundreds of people. I got to do something that I could never do by myself. The same thing happens for you and me in Christ Church. We can do amazing, world-changing, Toronto-impacting stuff that we could never do on our own, but because we are part of a community. Do you see it? We get to envision changing Toronto and changing the world because we gather around a vision that we do together. All right, so far, we have seen that the church happens when and where? When the spirit and truth combine to supernaturally transform us. When our love for one another has a place to be experienced. And third, we get to envision changing the world together because there are lots of us. All right, I, I could have used your help on this next one, all right? Because fourth and finally, our united prayers and praise to God are supernaturally. Now here's where I, I went to the thesaurus. I, I trying to find a word that just... It multiplies it. It's exponential. It's just, uh, so here's the word. Our united prayers and praise to God are supernaturally exponentializationized. That's the best I could come up with, all right? What am I talking about? I'm talking about, listen, one person praying to God, you pray to God alone, that is powerful. What if it's two? Jesus says, again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. That's exponential. Just to go from one to two. And then what about one person meeting with God? That is powerful. But what about, look at, where two or three, Jesus says, gather in my name, there I am with them. Just see how it just goes from one. As soon as you get together with others, it just grows. What about a whole church praising and praying to God? That's where exponentialization occurs, all right? After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. You know, remember last weekend, even when persecution restricted the church from having those big physical gatherings that they had had, when they prayed together, even though it was just a remnant in Jerusalem, because the rest of them were scattered and some were in prison, but that remnant in that home of John Mark's mother's home, when they prayed together, Peter was delivered from prison. It's just amazing when we get together, the power that we can have that we cannot have if we just pray or praise alone. And last weekend, uh, there, there was just a great uh, Q&A time question. Just, we, we stayed for over a half an hour just answering questions. And, and, and talking together about the power of prayer, I want to talk to you about the power of praise today. I want to invite you to do something at the end today when we, we, we go into some praise and a song that says hallelujah, a word of praise to the Lord. I want to invite you to do something that, well, you could do it alone and that'd be powerful, but when you're doing with others, it is... It is exponentializationized, all right? It's just amazing. God says, I, I, I'll do things that are beyond anything that you could ever ask for or even imagine. It's according to his power that is at work among us. 
the apostle says. And so this weekend, let's end with something that has that ex- exponential potential. We're going to praise. And whether you, whether you sing out loud, I don't know where you're at, and who you're with, but whether you sing out loud or you just sing sincerely from your heart, when you express praise to Jesus today, you're joining together with, with hundreds, likely over thousand people uh, in Toronto and even around different places in Canada, around the world. And, and something powerful happens. As I could tell you from personal experience, something powerful happens when you're facing something where you don't want to praise, you don't want to feel, you, you don't feel you have anything to be a whole lot of, a whole lot thankful for, but you just go ahead and praise. Just something happens. That, that, that power that comes in when you're, you're praising God with others, it just lifts your heart up and it lifts your vision up. And, and, and Jesus told his disciples one time when they, they got that just us virus, he said, lift up your eyes and see. Lift up your eyes and see. There, there are people there right now that have needs. And so I want to invite you to lift up your eyes today. We're going to sing a song that, that says this. It says, Lord, you give life. <laughs> are you thankful that he's given you life? Whatever's going on in your life, you have life. You are love. You imagine if he wasn't a God of love? You bring light to the darkness. What if he had left us in our darkness? You give hope. <laughs> Whatever the best medical science says, about the future of our planet or the future of the human race, whatever the best politicians say, he, he gives us hope because we, we have life, we have hope beyond that. You restore, how many need his restoration today? Every heart that is broken. You do all this, Lord. You heal broken hearts. So, so I pour out my praise to you, Lord. I pour out my praise. Listen, I can play that on Spotify this week alone. And that's powerful. But when I praise with you today, it can be supernaturally exponentializationized. <laughs> I've seen Jesus do more in just a, a few moments with him where I focus on him and I, I, I express gratitude that I don't even maybe feel. But then the more I express it, the I begin to feel it and I rise above. I, I've got stress and worry and anxiety, but I praise you anyway. <laughs> And that power that is exponentialized, it, just, it just, just begins to burst forth. And we're doing it with others today. I invite you to just relax. Take the next few moments. Relax in the presence of Jesus. Together now, whatever, whatever you're facing emotionally, physically, relationally, psychologically, in the workplace, financially, whatever you're facing, just begin to think of what you do have because of Jesus and his love and his hope and his restoration. And begin to praise him. Wherever you are geographically, you could be in Toronto, across Canada, someplace around the world. You're joining together with others. <laughs> and uh, when we begin to praise him together, he does something beyond what we could ever ask or imagine. So are you ready? Are you ready? Let's go to church. Thanks for listening. If you found this helpful, we hope you join us at one of our campuses if you're in the GTA for a weekend gathering. If you're listening from somewhere else in the world, we'd encourage you to join us at onechurch.to slash live. We believe everyone can be a part of what Jesus is doing both in our community and in our city. So if you'd like to connect with us at a deeper level, visit us at onechurch.to slash next steps. See you next time. Thank you.